Welcome everyone to our September PL Andres All Hands meeting. Thank you all for joining us. We're going to do a quick working group update, highlighting some of the um, projects that we work on and some of the teams that are contributing updates on KPIs, highlights, updates, things like that. And then we have a number of awesome spotlights on new things that have launched or are launching soon uh, across kind of the teams that, that contribute to Endres. And then we'll do two deep dives, one on ProBlab for NAT hole punching success rate measurements, and one from Phil Infra on IPFS operator. So super excited for those two. As a reminder, we are one of many wonderful teams in the Protocol Labs network where we drive breakthroughs in computing technology to push humanity forward. We think that the internet is one of humanity's superpowers and we want to make sure it is built on a robust foundation that is empowering of all sorts of amazing future uh, breakthroughs and that we're helping drive those forward effectively. Um, we do that through the building up of these awesome open source protocols and projects. We contribute super heavily to IPFS, LibP2P, and Filecoin, but we're also constantly finding new opportunities to push this ecosystem forward, building and helping nucleate new projects, um, and also contributing heavily to other open source ecosystems, building things like IPLD, TestGround, DRAND, and many more. Our mission is to scale and unlock new opportunities for IPFS, Filecoin, LibP2P, and related protocols. We do this in three main ways by onboarding awesome new developers and contributors into this ecosystem, driving breakthroughs in protocol utility and capability, and scaling all of our work through network native research, development, and deployment. We're made up of a ton of different teams that all participate in the Andres Working Group. Um, if you want to join us, please let me know. We are now have some of our first Endres uh, teams participating outside of uh, kind of the PL Starfleet organization. So excited for that. Um, and we also have a lot of open roles. So if you're looking to join one of our teams, um, please take a look here. There's an open job here. You can use your phone here. Um, but we have a, a lot of teams looking for engineering managers, TPMs, product managers, infra engineers, software engineers, research engineers. You know, you work on it. We would love to, to hear more about you. So um, please reach out and uh, see if you can get involved. Our strategy as a working group for 2022 um, has remained constant. Um, we are now in almost the end of Q3 and have made a ton of progress against these items. Um, the first one is growing the talent that is working in this ecosystem and helping empower and give them great developer experience in UX. Um, second is making sure that we have robust storage and retrieval across IPFS and Filecoin, helping many groups accelerate their data onboarding, um, building up uh, reliable tools around retrievals and a lot of different layers of the protocol, and then enabling effective uh, developer adoption and usage. Um, we have a ton of work happening around breakthroughs in programmability, scalability, and compute. This is around FBMs and retrieval markets and um, scaling the Filecoin chain consensus and computation over data in Filecoin and many other breakthroughs that we're working hard on. Uh, and we do all of the above while keeping our first and foremost focus on critical network operations, helping um, kind of act as stewards around releasing open source implementations that push these projects forward. We have, are just finishing Q3. So this is going to be the, the last time we talk about our Q3 goals. As a working group, we kind of had four main foci um, graded here. We did really, really well on scaling knowledge and developers and keeping critical systems running. We did pretty good on driving through some of these network breakthroughs. Um, we have now 36, I believe, smart contracts deployed on FEM testnet, which is awesome, super cool. Um, and we still have room to go on robust accessible storage. Um, we haven't quite hit our very ambitious goals in this area that we've made a ton of progress. Um, I think we, this actually needs to be updated to two pebabytes as our all time high. Uh, and I think, um, yeah, successful retrievals is like now back at 250k. So we're still making a ton of progress. We just have a lot, you know, long ways to go to hit our ambitious goals in this area. We are also spending a lot of time on the overall Filecoin core improvements roadmap. Um, there's a lot of work right now going into uh, Filecoin Network 17, which I think we'll hear an update on later. Um, you'll also get an update on Ceiling as a Service, which the Lotus team has been doing some awesome work around um, collaborating with our friends um, in the Outer Core team. Um, and then there's also a lot of work happening for future milestones, building the momentum around FVM um, and building momentum around things that will launch on top of the FVM in the future. So super exciting. And with that, I'll pass off to, I think, Gus for an IPFS update. Hey, everyone. It's Gus. For those of you who don't know, IPFS is a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, web protocol designed to preserve and grow humanity's knowledge uh, by making the web upgradable, resilient, and more open. Uh, we finally passed 500,000 new nodes in a week, which was a 
cool milestone continues to grow at a constant rate um, and we held the line uh, on latency at 400 milliseconds for finding content providers and uh, we also held the line on, on PRs opening and closing at similar rates as they did last month. Product updates, um, we've got some new specs. Uh, we, we've closed out the redirect file support, which will be coming in the next uh, Kubo release, I believe. Working on TAR gateway response formats and a, a new format for specifying deny lists for IPFS gateways. Um, and I believe today we're cut, Kubo is cutting the first RC for 0 0.16, which includes uh, IPNSV2 signatures being required. So we're finally starting to chip away at IPNSV1, redirect file support for gateways, and we're launching reframe routing support so that you can configure uh, your IPFS node or your Kubo node uh, to, uh, you can, you have, you know, fine-grained control over the content routing. JS IPFS uh, launched uh, enhanced DOS protection and some pretty significant improvements for BitSwap. And on the Hydras, we launched uh, integration with SID.contact, which is a step forward for a Filecoin and IPFS interop. We uh, added S3 exports for all the data that the Hydras see, since they have a pretty good view of the entire network so that we can do lots of cool data analysis. And so, yeah, for the next month, we're going to be prepping for IPFS camp and working on roadmaps. Uh, that's basically going to take up all of our time. And we've got a new Unix FS spec coming too, which is going to unblock some people working on other IPFS implementations and uh, upgrading libp2p, which has a lot of fun stuff in it, like resource management, which is something we've been wanting for years on Kubo. That's it. Awesome. Super excited to see Reframe. Speaking of all those lippy to goodies, passing off to the lippy to team. Martin, maybe? Uh, hello, I'm Martin. Um, for those of you who don't know, lippy 2 p is the, uh, it's a peer-to-peer -peer networking stack. Uh, it's used by IPFS, it's used by Falcon, by a lot of other projects. A lot has happened recently. So first of all, we started revamping our doc site. It has been long, long, long neglected, neglected, but now Danny has joined us and is helping us rewrite everything and getting things up to date. Uh, stay tuned for updates there. We'll have a lippy 2 p day on IPFS camp in Lisbon on October 30th. It would be great to see a lot, many people of you there. The community call is, had, is continuing to happen on a regular basis. Last time there were 16 people on the call. Uh, we never had that many people on the call, so that's really exciting. Um, what what happens implementation-wise? Um, so Libp2P has been traditionally been very good at connecting standalone nodes using TCP, using Quick, using hole punching. So that worked uh, worked very well. We haven't been very good at connecting browsers to the network, um, which is pretty important because browsers are used a lot on the web. Um, so we are focusing on two two new transports there. One is web transport. Uh, it's a new protocol under development um, by the IATF. It's already implemented in Chrome, and since the uh, 023 release of Goli P2P, which happened uh, this week, it's also supported by Goli P2P. So what, what, what can we do with it? Any Chrome browser uh, running JS Li P2P um, can now connect to any Goli P2P node without any further configuration. It just works out of the box. Um, so as I said, this is released in GoLibP2P. 2 js p 2 p will release this uh, very soon. This will work. The second effort we've been engaging on is WebRTC, which would allow any browser to connect to any other browser on the network. Uh, we've been partnering with uh, a company called Little Bear Labs. Um, they've been helping us with writing the spec and writing the different implementations. And um, the Go and the JS side of it is currently in the code review process, and um, they are, uh, we're still working on the on the Rust implementation. Regarding hole punching, uh, ProbeLab has has been doing some some exciting measurements, and you'll hear more about that in the deep dive. So I won't uh, say anything more about this here. Uh, as I already mentioned, we met, we released Go 0 P023 um, earlier this week with experimental web transport support. Uh, we also have better handling for DNS address uh, multi addresses, uh, which we use for, for WebSocket. 
Other than that, uh, JS lib B2P 39 was released. Um, we now have finally have YAML support, which is super cool because it, it will allow us to deprecate Mplex, which has causing has been causing us so many problems um, over over the years. Um, at some point, it also has um, enhanced DOS protection by introducing uh, all kinds of limits. What's coming up for, for October? Um, we'll be continuing the work on, on WebRTC. We'll be launching a website. Uh, giving an overview of all the different transport options that we now have. We'll also do some summer work on the P2P day and prepare all the talks uh, that we are planning to give there. That's it That's from my awesome. side. Hey, given, given this list of awesome things shipping, it's going to be some exciting talks uh, in Lisbon. So everyone better go to the P2P day. Over to Peter for IPDX. Yeah, I'm Peter uh, from IP Developer Experience. Uh, our team caters IP stewards mostly. Uh, so we we try to empower all the teams that you've seen so far to, to do their best work. Uh, recently on the test ground front, uh, we now cover uh, interop, interop testing in Leap P2P uh, with test ground between Go and Rust and between uh, within the languages themselves, and that runs on every PR in both Go and Rust with P2Ps. Uh, on GitHub management front, uh, we added new feature uh, that uh, can automate config fixes. So we can now do things like ensure that every repository in, in any PL org has a specific setting enabled or disabled. Uh, so that's pretty cool. We also established a GitHub management stewards teams uh, in all orgs with GitHub management. Uh, so there are more people to review your PRs. Uh, developments in GitHub Actions. Uh, I know many of you complained that there is no uh, SSH debugging experience on, on, on par with Circle CI in GitHub Actions. So uh, we went ahead and, and fix that. Uh, so if you if you were missing that, reach out. And what's coming next? Uh, we are driving Kuba release uh, so that we can improve the process going forward. Uh, so that's pretty cool. We are also working on moving uh, Kuba workflows from Circle CI to, to GitHub Actions. Uh, in GitHub management, we want to start uh, managing IPFS examples with GitHub management. And finally, on the test ground front, uh, we are supporting Bloxico to, to bring test ground to, to EKS. Uh, we are going to support little bear labs on browser testing support in P2P uh, so that we can cover JS as well. Uh, and yeah, and we're going to do more stuff on the P2P testing side of things. And we're also preparing for lab week and especially P2P day at lab week. So we're going to be there. Uh, come find us. We're happy to talk with everyone. Thank you. Awesome. Over to Filecoin. As it says here, Filecoin, we're trying to build a crypto backed power storage network for humanity most important data. And we have some matrix to shell. Uh, the network's uh, storage capacity start, uh, you know, uh, continues to grow steadily. Uh, yeah, it's slowing on a little bit, but again, we have a lot of good capacity for a lot of good data available. So if you have some data to store, go ahead, come to the network. Uh, we have increased number of data stored in Filecoin over the past week. It's not like slowing down at all. So we are hitting almost like 190 pip uh, uh, in total of bytes uh, that's stored in Filecoin network. We also hit our new daily high uh, of like data onboarding, which is like 2.18 pip, which is like super exciting, uh, super close. No, one step closer to over five pip per day, like go. So that's very exciting. Next slide. Uh, Molly has mentioned this roadmap. Uh, I'm just going to give a quick update on what's going on right now. Yes, we have the Shark 2 release. That will be our Falcon Network V17 uh, upgrade. I have a slide later to go into detail, but the uh, rough timeline is a, a target at like mid November for Filecoin mainnet uh, upgrade. There's a lot of amazing work happens in FEM. There's a spotlight later as well. A great conversation on if for uh, address class, which is enable more like user deployed actors to uh, assign like subname spaces. Uh, FEM is also working on like weekly or say every two weeks, at least every two weeks, there's a new release uh, in the next upcoming one. We 
had the same JSON-RPC enabled and uh, integrated with its tooling, and it will be in Lotus very soon. Uh, so super excited. Uh, Foundry uh, cohort zero is graduated. Now we're kicking off uh, the early builder foundry like one really soon uh at where should start beginning i really want to mention there are 63 smart contracts that was being developed in the last cycle of the release so if you are someone want to start to build on fevm uh head into fvm channel or the feel want to be discuss channel to join the network to deploy your own contract we have more updates on the builder net that is a and to ship around like you know November December and more details will coming soon there. As Momac mentioned earlier, uh, Lotus has shipped um, the enabler for CD as a service in Lotus V one seventeen two. Right now it's in testing. Uh, there's a lot of like uh, actual CD as a service integration work happens right now. And during that channel, if you are interested, if you are start further, there are want to try the service to help us to test it out, uh, go through that channel as well to set up. We also have an amazing update from our few crypto team on Halo 2. It's now fully integrated into the proof code and can be used to generate off outgoing um, proof. Um, team is working on some like benchmarking and the current benchmark shows the performance is slightly like slower than cross 60. However, team is working on uh, optimize that. Uh, once Halo 2 uh, proof recursion is released, we will have like even better understanding on the performance aspect of it. Uh, and the team is also working on integrating GPU field uh, and that is, uh, the curve uh, into Halo 2 uh, so that um, the performance like wind time can be uh, even faster. Uh, if you want to follow this work, uh, go join Field Proof channel on the following slide. So many exciting milestones that are being built towards uh, awesome work team. Super, super exciting. We're going to jump into some more team updates from some of the specific teams working towards this, starting with NetOps. This week, our NetOps update more still around our KPI. Um, our 95 TEFB is a job to like um, around four seconds. Uh, we're still working on it to make even uh, further, we are also working with the center team to see if can we leverage our decentralized CDM to make our performance even better. Uh, for the IPFS class 13, um, still a lot of uh, a ping there, 532 million a ping happen uh, for last two weeks. Um, our gateway request increased a lot <laughs> because the inferior <laughs> stopped their public gateway. Um, it's a good thing uh, that basically we can, that means we can handle more traffic with a very good quality. But in the meantime, we definitely want to encourage your in community to run in the gateway with us. If you want to run the gateway with, uh, for the community, let us know. We can help. So we want to get the number down, but in the meantime, we want to get the total number up for the whole world. Um, the unified user is a 12 million. Uh, yes, increase a lot. It's because um, uh, Infora start their uh, gateway, but we're also hoping the community will come in, helping us to run the gateway to make our IPFS gateway really decentralized to the work. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Over to Patrick for Retrieval Markets. Hello. Uh, retrieval Markets update. We've got from the Retrieval Market Working Group, we set out uh, in 2022 with an audacious goal to, to build a retrieval network that would serve sub-second retrieval as well data stored on Filecoin. We're making good progress towards this, but I think that goal is perhaps at risk to get done in 2022. I think we just took on a little bit too much, but I think by hopefully Q, end of Q1 2023, we st should start to connect these retrieval networks to storage providers and uh, really start to see the integration between different parts of the network and the retrieval times, time to first byte tumbling down. Uh, the Retrieval Market Working Group has, is a collection of teams and they're all working on different pieces of this overall puzzle. Uh, and inside Entrez, we have two teams which are working on particular parts of this too. The Saturn team is working on a DCDN for Filecoin. Uh, currently, they're working on what's called the Saturn Sunrise program to get the first set of L1 nodes uh, to join the network and give feedback. And in time for Lisbon, uh, we hope to get the, the public launch of L1 nodes so anyone around the world can run these. These are the, the entry point to the Saturn network um, that people can run and will be running primarily in data centers. Uh, there's also the L2 nodes coming down the line later this year and early next year. And that's, those are the nodes that can be run on people's home computers. And then there's station, as we speak about home computers, 
a desktop app for Filecoin. In time for Lisbon, we hope to have a closed alpha release where everyone on this call should at least be able to download this. And then by the end of this year, a public release of this desktop app, which will open up so many different opportunities, not just in retrieval markets, but across all parts of the Filecoin ecosystem. Awesome. You can all reach out to Patrick and the teams on Slack. Over to Vic for Crypto Econ Lab. Hi, everyone. Um, so a uh, quick update on the on the team. We're, we're continuing to grow. So Shram Shridhar has just joined us as a research scientist. Please, you know, welcome him. He's super nice, doesn't bite. Um, then the next thing is uh, FIP36. Um, one final update here uh, is it's being put up to to a poll on, on Phil poll right now. Um, it's at the, this poll closes September 28th. In line with the poll, the governance team from the foundation has released a governance, the gov a governance process, which you can read, which will, you know, determine what, whether or not this FIP will be included in the NV17 upgrade uh, following the results of Phil poll. Um, we have released like a, a public dashboard where you can see running poll results. Um, I've taken a screen grab of that on the right. So you can see um, the various stakeholder groups, how they voted and also their participation rate. Why a poll? Um, this FIP has, clear, has been pretty contentious. Uh, if you've been tuned in, there's been a lot of discussion and debate over the past three months. Uh, as a result, because due to the need to find some kind of resolution, uh, we have uh, the governance team has decided to put this up to to the poll, uh, to, to a poll. Um, quick, quick thing as to why this matters. Uh, we have really does some, done some public AMAs and uh, released public materials on this, but the, the short summary is uh, we believe that the 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 FIP is imperative due to the potential state of the global economy coupled with the the, the crypto downturn we are seeing at the moment. Um, this FIP is designed to help uh, you know stabilize the network uh, to create an incentive, stru incentive structures that uh, protect the network against potential like shocks and, and continued uh, you know down downwards movements uh, so uh, we 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 have you know publicly kind of stated that if this fit were, were to to be rejected um, it may not be considered again until q2 2023 um, just due to network upgrade timelines and and, and the availabilities of uh, teams to you know continue working on this uh, but so that is an important kind of opportunity cost or trade-off when, when kind of making a decision um, when, when voting. But the important thing is, regardless of your stance, please vote. Um, it does not matter if you vote to accept or vote to reject. Um, I, these these are our viewpoints as to why we think it's good. But the on, on a higher level, we think participation in general it should be the goal. So regardless of your stance, please vote um, on on a fill poll. There you uh, if you know whatever bucket of uh, of a group you fall into. Um, I like that idea, Nicola, but, um, and, and, and the results will, uh, you know, continue to be publicly available. Um, and, and, and therefore this decision will be, uh, the, will be made. And yes, I agree with Jenny, please do your own research. I've tried to link as many helpful documents as possible. The best place to start is probably the fifth, fifth, like fifth draft itself, uh, and then move on to various discussion threads, et cetera. Um, so, uh, the last thing is, we understand that there, this is very complicated. It's not. It's not a simple decision, and you know, doing your own research is is important. So we are also hosting office hours uh, tomorrow, Friday, 9 a.m. UTC, to answer any questions. So just please drop in. Um, I'll be there. Some others will be there uh, to talk about stock with FIP. So thank you all. Awesome. Go vote. Big thank you to the Glyph team for making it really easy for people to vote, even using like Glyph Wallet or Ledgers or other things like that. So if you're a token holder, you can vote. If you're a storage provider, you can vote. If you are a client storing data on the network, I know some people have stored their entire backups, you can vote. Um, and, you know, if you're a core dev, you can vote. So definitely come come and engage. Voting is good. Um, and do your research to, to you know, have your, your perspective on this but be heard. Cool. Passing it off to George for Bifrost. Hey, everyone. I'm George for Bifrost. Uh, yeah, echoing what Justin said earlier, we are now up to 1.3 billion requests a week, 12 million unique users, most likely from uh, taking on all the traffic from the uh, now defunct uh, in front gateway. Uh, time towards byte is down to four seconds uh, from seven seconds, I believe, last time we uh, we reported. We've updated the clusters to the latest version, which has a couple of uh, fixes for Go routine leaks and memory leaks, so that should make it a lot uh, a lot better. Uh, also, in the process of migrating to a new disk layout in ZFS, uh, which should result in improved caching and monitoring. Thank you, Matt Geddes, for putting that together for us. 
Also, our team has grown from two to four. Welcome, Jeff and Carl. We're actually wrapping up, wrapping up our team week here in Barcelona. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. And thank you to Jesse and Hector for all the help with the logistics and, and, and the planning. Uh, quick opportunities. Uh, we've, we, so we've switched to consistent hashing, which has had a huge impact on time to first flight. We're seeing much better numbers. However, we're, we're starting to identify some uh, hotspots and I think we can improve the hashing algorithm by uh, by tweaking it, uh, uh, the values a little bit. So we're actually going to do that, uh, test that out next week. Uh, bad bits, uh, there's a bit of a pain point there where uh, trying to block thousands of CIDs at once, which is what we've been getting on the uh, in the Pedusa uh, mailbox lately, is causing the pipeline to lock up or create PRs with, with conflict, which uh, ends up uh, creating a lot of uh, manual work. So we were looking for a fix for that. And working with David Gasquez to export Gabriel traffic logs, logs from uh, Elasticsearch into BigQuery for easier aggregation, and also would allow us to trim our Elasticsearch bill, which is currently growing. Yeah, finals on Slack or in Notion, that's it. Awesome, great to see that increased usage without harming performance. Over to our spotlights, starting with the shark upgrade, Jennifer. Of the shark two days. If you are wondering why we codenamed the network and V17 upgrade called Shred, uh, core contributor of this upgrade, and Ground Zero, decided to pop in one of the one was super casual with me saying that, hey, I've been surfing with some sharks uh, in my vacation time. And I'm like, oh, great, cool those to that. Uh, but anyhow, uh, there's a lot of amazing flips that's in will be included in the network MV17 upgrade. So we're enabling beneficiary address for storage providers, which is one way towards a um, better landing market for SPs. Uh, with FBM, it will be even better, I believe. Uh, thanks to Kuba, we are resolved a six significant weakening of Filecoin Polar Security uh, Guarantee concern uh, in this upgrade as well. Uh, we are focused on enabling programmable storage market uh, to, um, you know, towards an FVM launch, uh, FIB 41 and FIB 45 are for that special call out to the decoupling Falcon Plus from Marketplace. This is our star, our blue heart of this upgrade. Uh, so we are the couple, uh, we are making data cap and the QAP brings um, to the and to the sector to start trying to restore them to actually be associated with the data itself instead of the deal. And so now you can basically, the client or anyone who cares about the, the data that's stored on Filecoin can, can you know, have the term on the data cap and extend that term if they want. So that storage provider will store that data as long as possible on the Falcon network. It's a huge step towards user program um, both storage market. And yes, we're introducing our first fungible token contract. It's a data cap actor. It's going to be one of the built-in actor that will be shipped in this release. I link the fungible token standard and the token contract library uh, in the slide. Uh, if you're interested in it, it's very early stage. So we're going to iterate over the time. Um, but if you have experience on that, uh, please participate in the conversation. Um, uh, I don't want to forget about FIP44, which is thanks to a huge, uh, we are enabling any metadata authentication for user data actor. Uh, we are trying to set a good foundation for a lot of use case that can be deployed with FBVM uh, before the next network upgrade. Uh, so that's our goal. Uh, as mentioned, uh, FIP36 currently is and being in pulled out right now. Uh, if yet the community, the ecosystem decide the FIP is accepted because of the uh, time sensitivity, we have the core dev have agreed that if you were accepted, we will include that in, in the uh, network in the shark uh, upgrade. Uh, and we, because uh, it's extending the sector max lifetime. Uh, we also want to make sure our pull rep, uh, lifetime security is secure. So we are considering finalized uh, FIP, uh, 47 as well uh, in this upgrade. A uh, rough timeline, we're still targeting mid-October uh, for the calibration upgrade and uh, early mid-November. Uh, uh, for the main upgrades, thanks to Sandground in North Cuba, uh, a year's job for all the development, also shamelessly plug in. We're doing a Lotus data onboarding and friends summit at Phil Lisbon uh, on November the 2nd. The whole team will be there. If you have any question about the shark, let us know. We will we'll be there. Awesome. Over to Magic for Sealing as a Service. So yeah, finally, after a whole bunch of discussions and a lot of implementation work, uh, we've landed basically all the 
code that's necessary on, on the Lotus side to support seeing services. This is basically just a few new APIs. What they allow Lotus to do is to import sectors which have been sealed externally. And also they may have been only partially sealed. So miners can pay some service to do pre commit one and two for them. And then they can download those sectors and finish, finish the ceiling themselves. This basically allows miners to optimize how they use hardware. Uh, this allows miners to pay other services to the ceiling for them. Maybe in the future, uh, we can extend it so that you can have service providers run all the compute needed to, to run a Falcon node and you would only store data locally. This could let us deliver, deliver the uh, mine Falcon with a NAS on your desk uh, use case that is possible, it's just not right now. Uh, so we can do it. Yeah, the other, other use cases that can emerge from, from this work is uh, seeing compute marketplaces, uh, which could morph into more general marketplaces later. Uh, this is also something that Bacalao could provide in the future and integrate with this. Uh, so yeah, there is there's a lot of very exciting features emerging from, from this seemingly simple Lotus feature. And yeah, a lot of these things that are not possible with this is thanks to the design discussions that were had for quite some time. So yeah, if you if you want to check out how it was designed, then maybe still have more input on it. Check out the GitHub discussion. Cam hang out in the bill seeing as a service Slack channel. Yeah, that's that's seeing as a service. Awesome. I know people have for a long time uh, wanted to be able to uh, be participants in the Filecoin economy with uh, devices with less, uh, you know, GPU capacity. So that's super exciting and also super exciting for all of those poor proof of work miners who now no longer have a home in Ethereum who can maybe come and bring their services here without also having to invest in a lot of um, storage hardware. They can partner with existing SPs and just provide their um, like GPU ceiling services to help scale um, our community here, which is awesome. And so thank you for working on this magic and excited to see it come to fruition. Passing over to Steve, speaking uh -huh. of the merge. Yeah, you, you bet. So this is a simple, you know, there's not necessarily a new announcement versus last week, but it, it, uh, it's worth repeating, right? Lib2P is securing Ethereum's main, main net, a huge milestone here. And one of the things I love about this is just that it is very much a long-term effort, right? So there are talks back from DevCon 2 where David and Juan were, uh, you know, already started to beat this drum and talk about how they could integrate. We had great notes and ideas being brainstormed, getting a we had a, uh, you know, connected with Parity to do a Rust implementation of libp2p in 2017, 2019. We got into the Ethereum uh, networking specification. There was a whole bunch of community management work and, you know, implement implementation management that had to go on that Raul and others were helping lead. Uh, and there was key new functionality that had to be added, like Gossip Sub, which happened in 2020. So there's been a there's been a long journey. I love that uh, we were planting seeds six plus years ago that are now really bearing fruit today. Uh, so major, major props to um, folks in the past, like Raul, David, and Juan, and also the, the current team. You know, there's been a lot of work going on behind the scenes to make sure libp2p is secure and ready for this, you know, the big moment of, of the merge. And it's, it's been successful. And so now we see a, you know, multiple libp2p implementations uh, helping secure a network of over 400,000 validators. So great job to the team. And uh, yeah, excited for more good times ahead. Awesome. Over to awesome. you, and definitely last but not least, FVM. FVM, so what's happening? Uh, there's a ton of news across the board. Uh, I've structured them in kind of like the working groups that, that we have in the FVM team. First, uh, a bunch of updates from, from engineering. We have, as others, others have announced uh, uh, previously, we have a new testnet uh, that is live, that is operated by Factor8 Solutions. Uh, this is Patrick. Uh, it is a testnet that is updated roughly every week uh, because we are conducting incremental delivery of the of the roadmap of, of FEM M2.1 uh, for the Selenium release. So this is the release that went out uh, two weeks ago. We had 63 smart contracts deployed on that network uh, with this new release that went out last week, which is Copper, it's named Copper. Uh, we had 23 smart contracts deployed on the network and we're expecting to put out a new release next week. Uh, hopefully everything will go well for this one because it's a huge one because it's gonna add 
full uh, JSON RPC support, uh, Ethereum JSON RPC support to Lotus, which is then going to allow uh, unlocking downstream, a lot of downstream testing effort and integration effort with native Ethereum tools like MetaMask, Remix, Foundry, because all of these actually access functionality in the Ethereum or EVM compatible network through that JSON RPC API. And also we're pushing for feature completeness of the EVM runtime, so which we are codenaming Febim uh, by adding support for for more opcodes that are still missing from that implementation that are currently panicking. Now, uh, there are several architectural changes uh, that are going into the Filecoin network to actually support all of the changes that are kind of like all, all of the structural changes that are needed uh, in the model to support things like addressing, native addressing in the Ethereum network, in, in, in EVM contracts, uh, and also to support things like uh, native Ethereum transactions that are emitted and issued from wallets like MetaMask, Wallet Connect, and so on. We want to support those out of the box. So there are two key changes that are going into, into that we're proposing uh, for inclusion in FEM 2.1. That's the F4 address class, uh, which uh, uh, Jennifer already mentioned a little bit about. This is a hierarchical delegated address class. So basically there will be uh, address managers on chain where the first one is going to be an Ethereum address manager. And this is going to be able to provide uh, different addressing identities for actors on chain such that because normally just, just to back up a little, the FEM is built as a polyglot runtime that is able to accommodate runtimes uh, from other chains to make that integration of um, contracts from those chains easier over and, and simple. And in many cases, those runtimes actually come with their implicit assumptions about addressing. This is usually the, the case. So having a way that we can, in the Falcon protocol, um, work with those addressing assumptions at a native level is is pretty important. This is where F4 comes comes from. A contract abstraction allows us to validate uh, Ethereum native transactions in the protocol within user space without actually having to modify the protocol. That's why that is important. And then uh, finally, we're also starting the work stream on the EVM storage footprint optimization in partnership with Consensus Lab with, with Akosh. Um, now, on the developer experience front, uh, we had a ton of success with the early builders F1 program, which focused all around uh, the native tooling. They is, there's a link in there with a blog post on everything that they built. We're graduating the F0 cohort in the next weeks. Uh, and we're starting a new cohort. This is called F1. And this one is going to focus all around DBM and FEBM, FEBM use cases. We received 55 applications. We have select, selected 31 of those. And we've divided uh, the participants into two groups, the core group, which will get uh, very close support from the FEM team and the peer builders who will be kind of like community oriented. Now we're also incubating the developer forums and the, and the docs. Uh, that's a provisional URL. Uh, that is going to be moving to a Filecoin.io domain uh, soon, hopefully. Matt also published a Twitch stream deploying contracts, dem demoing how to deploy contracts on Wallaby together with Jimpik. Jimpik is also on fire. He's putting out a ton of walkthroughs on Observable HQ with like every every release that we put out there. He's the first one to just grab, put his hands on, on top of it, just experiment with it. It's just awesome to have that energy in, in, in early builders. On the product front, we're pushing for uh, designing a what's going to be the new a new network uh, in 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 five, a new Filecoin network, which is designed to be a canary network uh, as a spin-off economy from mainnet. So this is a network that is going to move fill from mainnet and um, is going to basically allow users to experiment with early technology, such as uh, the FEM before it's actually released on mainnet by using real value. Uh, we're planning to launch Buildernet if everything goes well by November the 8th. So this will be just after Phil Lisbon and all the events in Lisbon, uh, Lab Week and so on. So there will be, you'll hear a lot of drum rolls and a lot of uh, presentations around this as well to pave the way. Uh, Andy is also conducting a ton of interviews across the org to collect input around use cases that people want to build immediately on FBM. Remember, the, the, the goal and the success of FBM is not just shipping the technology, but actually building, enabling the, the building of the use cases that people are just have been waiting and dying to build for a long time. So we want to make sure that we're able 
to provide that we understand what those use cases are, that we provide guidance uh, to these teams. It's likely that we're going to be putting out solution blueprints going forward uh, for some of these use cases to kind of like provide light guidance uh, on how to build things like, for example, compute over data networks or how to build L2s or how to build uh, stuff like perpetual storage and things like that that people really care about. Now, if you have a use case uh, and Adi hasn't reached out to you yet, make sure that you reach out to Adi so that he gets a chance to, to put it on the radar for, for us. This is also very important because a key epic in FEM 2.1 is actually re-engineering the built-in API, the app, the public APIs of built-in actors, uh, so that they're able to cater uh, for all those use cases that people want to build. Uh, on the audits front, we're booking uh, two external auditors for FEBIM, preparing uh, security audits. We're planning to involve the PL network at large to come and vet the code base. Um, so there's going to be some comms that go out there. Uh, we're also assembling an internal red team. So if you want to participate in reviewing and auditing the FEM code base as it gets closer to uh, being prepared for, for production, then reach out to Dragon here and he'll he'll add you to, to the list of potential auditors. Uh, we're also going to be inviting the research, the security research community at large to participate in, in reviewing. So we're scouting if you have like really talented security researchers that are potentially working in academia or other places or maybe like more amateur or whatever that are not really going to conduct a formal audit, but they're could be acting as white hackers trying to break a test net that make sure to get to um, to speak to Dragon as well so that we record them in, in our candidates list and we reach out to them. And uh, as for upcoming launch plans, uh, the current projection for mainnet is uh, February the 8th. Uh, if everything goes to plan, build a net. If everything goes to plan, is scheduled to be launched on November the 8th, as I said uh, a, few, uh, a few seconds ago. And also, we're preparing our presence in Lisbon. Uh, so expect the FEM team to be there to meet with all of you, to chat with all of you about everything that you want to build, and to 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 do a ton of knowledge transfer as well. Awesome. Super exciting. And we have just enough time for five minutes each for our two deep dives, um, starting with Probe Lab. Dennis. Hi everyone, this is Dennis from ProBlab. Um, at ProBlab, we want to measure or we measure the performance of, of Web3 protocols and benchmark those protocols against target milestones and also um, propose improvements. And um, for this particular measurement campaign, we take a look at the net uh, hole punching success rate as uh, Martin already teasered earlier in this uh, presentation. You may know that NetTraverse is a quintessential problem in peer-to-peer -peer networks, and uh, currently we, re we rely on um, relay peers that uh, proxy that act as a, as a proxy for all our traffic. And um, since Kubo 0.13, actually all pieces are shipped and enabled by default for an uh, alternative technique um, that allows two peers to, behind nets to connect to each other. And this is um, hole punching via the DCUTR protocol, which is also linked there. Um, DCUTR stands for di um, direct connection upgrade through relay. And I will go to, um, into the details uh, in, in a bit. And in this measurement uh, project, uh, we want to uh, find out the success rate um, of this protocol. So how often are peers actually able to connect to each other? and maybe also uncover potential improvements uh, to this technique. So just briefly about um, this DCOTR protocol. Um, so hole punching in general um, happens when two peers simultaneously open a connection to each other at their predicted external addresses. And in this case, both routers of both peers um, update their state tables and have seen a packet going out. And if they have seen a packet going out, they also allow packets um, at that address um, that the packets went out to, um, to go in. And if both peers um, simultaneously connect to each other, um, they are actually able to, um, yeah, to establish a TCP or a quick connection um, as you wish. And so the problem here is the synchronization. So both peers need to do it at the same time. And this happens at a rendezvous point, so, so, uh, so we call it. And um, actually, since Kubo 0.13, all deployed Kubo nodes can act as such a uh, rendezvous point. And um, Max has actually given a great talk about uh, the whole protocol at Peer to Peer Paris earlier this year. Um, I highly recommend check it out. Um, yeah, it's linked down below. 
Right. So how do we want to measure the success rate of this protocol? So the challenge is how do we detect nutted peers? Um, the idea is that um, we just want to do a lot of hole punches to a diverse set of peers, um, but we actually don't know where they are. And um, the main idea here is that we deploy a honeypot and um, attract those peers behind nets. And this honeypot is just a DHT server node um, that walks around the DHT and it's, it's a very stable node. And this um, this and since it's a very stable node, we hope that other peers are actually um, including the honeypot peer into their routing table. So if peers behind nets um, request content from the network, um, they actually come across this honeypot. And if the honeypot uh, detects a peer that supports this DCOTR protocol and is also only reachable by a relay peer, which is the indicator that it's behind a net, then we save this inbound connection to a database. Then we have a second component here, that which is a server, which just serves um, uh, those detected nutted peers to, to a fleet of clients and also exposes another API to track the whole punch results. So these clients are actually um, run in, in a diverse set of home network or supposed to be run in a diverse set of home networks. And uh, these clients are actually just um, DCDR capable um, lib peer-to-peer -peer nodes. It's, um, we have two kind uh, two uh, implementations here, one in Rust and one in Go. And those clients actually just um, periodically query, query the server for nutted peers, then perform the whole punch dance, this DCDR protocol, and just report back how um, yeah report back the outcome if it worked or not. And uh, those the Rust client is actually implemented by Elena and Max. So shout out to both of them. So the progress so far is that the infrastructure is there. So this architecture that you've just seen is deployed and it's, it's working. And there's to Grafana dashboards also link, uh, the link uh, you can find down below. This is probably the, um, the most interesting part here. So what's the success rate? And there are already uh, some results here. So um, right now we have only four clients deployed and the success rate for these four clients is around, as you can see, 80%. So you can see the time on the X axis and the success rate, success rate on the Y axis. The success rate is around 80%, but it's less for peers that are in a VPN uh, network. Another improvement proposal or um, another improvement suggestion that we could make. So the, pro, um, the protocol actually, um, it tries this a whole punch, this whole punching thing a couple of times. And but we found out with this preliminary results that actually if it doesn't work with the first time, the second and third attempt also won't work. So we could actually stop the, um, the protocol there. And um, there are many more results um, for, for the four clients that I showed here. Um, you can find it at the link uh, there at more results. So what's next? Uh, we want to extend those clients. So the fleet of clients that we deployed. So this is a call out for you, for all of you to participate. Um, please check out this uh, Google form. Um, this will uh, just ask for your home network um, conditions, like which, which, which router do you have at your home network. And then uh, you will receive an API key and you can download um, the, these puncher clients that you've seen earlier and uh, just participate and um, contribute some data of your own network. And yeah, that's my brief deep dive, deep dive already. Thank you. Awesome. Now over to our last deep dive on IPFS operator, Corey. Hello, uh, my name is Corey. I'm with the Falcoin infrastructure team, and uh, this is about the IPFS operator. Uh, the IPFS operator is a Kubernetes operator that uh, is designed to help people run an IPFS uh, cluster or a set of IPFS nodes in the Kubernetes environment. Uh, the key feature of it is that it is a turnkey IPFS cluster. Uh, you can see the GIF working over there on the right. Uh, that GIF is actually going through the entire process that is required to set up uh, in, in a full-fledged uh, IPFS cluster. You can see that it's it's quite simple. Uh, it boils down to basically one uh, one command. The uh, goal of, of uh, this project is to spread the adoption of Web3 uh, and to enable it to be more easily run in high production environments, uh, particularly those that are found uh, you know, users who might run Kubernetes. What we would like to do is we would like to, uh, for Kubernetes operators, if they, if they have a storage need, if they, if they are uh, searching for 
what uh, what storage projects or what storage product that they want to use. IPFS should be right there where they right there next to you know Ceph and the rest uh, when they go through their catalog and they uh, wonder which product to make or which product to select. IPFS should should be there uh, right in their face and it should work for them and they should have a good time with it. Uh, this project is being developed in, in partnership with Red Hat. Uh, so I've included uh, our uh, GitHub link right there. Uh, we have moved recently. The uh, code has is now on I, in, in the IPFS uh, cluster org. It is the same code and the same project. This is just a zoomed in version just to really uh, hammer home, uh, hammer home uh, how easy it is to set up. Uh, you can see what, what we've got here. It's a very uh, simple, uh, configuration file that you can set up. You can just use your standard Kubernetes uh, utilities that uh, operators of this type will be very comfortable with and apply it to your cluster. A brief overview of how this uh, how this actually works. Uh, this is actually two uh, Kubernetes uh, controllers built into one binary. Uh, one of them is the IPFS uh, cluster operator itself, and the other one is, is a controller for uh, libp2p. Uh, this is an optional component that you can add in uh, in case you would like to use hole punching services that are not uh, simply the public hole punching services. But what I want to stress is that uh, this offers a complete uh, a complete package for everything that you might need to run your IPFS cluster in Kubernetes, uh, including all the things listed here, configuration, uh, cluster following, uh, all this comes straight out of the box. How do I get this thing? Uh, as I mentioned on the first slide, I want this to be right in front of your face when you uh, go to select a storage platform. Uh, it will soon, although not yet, it will be featured on the operator hub, uh, which is one of the things that uh, you, particularly users of OpenShift will, will be familiar. Uh, this is a catalog of uh, other IPF or other Kubernetes clusters or excuse me, other Kubernetes operators. Um, it will sit in in this uh, catalog right alongside, you know, uh, other things like Seth or Rook or something like that. Uh, additionally, this is for internal use cases mostly at the at the moment. If you happen to be running on our uh, Weave clusters, uh, IPFS is available as an option. Uh, you can get a cluster built, you know, by us to uh, that will have the operator pre-installed. These are some features that we are soon to land. Uh, these are not entirely uh, functioning if you were to run the code right now, but there are uh, PRs available for it. Uh, what we would like to do is have better support for external facing services. Wouldn't it be great if you could take advantage of this one click uh, installation facility and then uh, use this to operate your own IPFS gateway? I think so, uh, and we can make that happen. We have some Changes that are coming down the pike uh, that will that will be landing, uh, you know, before we get to the uh, IPFS camp. Where can I learn more? Uh, I've I put some screenshots here. Documentation can be seen in a number of places now. I, I've listed these in the comments of this slide if anybody is wondering. But uh, you can uh, always reach us at the uh, IPFS operator GitHub page. Uh, also, there are documents uh, documentations that can be seen on the on read the docs. Uh, there, we are featured on uh, Red Hat Next uh, project, uh, which I have a screenshot there. There have been a couple of talks that have discussed this project. Uh, one of them was by uh, myself at the uh, IPFS thing that happened in Iceland. And uh, also my colleague Oleg from Red Hat has done a talk at DevConf 2022. Adding to this list, uh, Oleg and I will be at the uh, IPFS camp in Lisbon. So uh, we will be doing a uh, talk there as well. So we will see you there. Thank you so much. Super, super exciting progress, everyone. Thank you for all of the awesome updates um, and excited as we build momentum into uh, actually getting to see so much of the community in person next month. Um, so thank you all. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their September.